Malaysian politics never a dull day. Uh, well, some some would say that is true of Singapore politics as well lately. But we are not here to discuss Singapore politics. We are here to discuss Malaysian politics. So welcome to episode sixty six. And with us, with me today, I will be having hopefully a special guest, uh, Mr. Sharil Hamdan, who is, in his own words, a politician on sabbatical. He was. He is actually still part of AMNO. He has been suspended for six years, and he is the co-host of Malaysia's number one political podcast. I assume it's Southeast Asia's number one political podcast as well. So, sorry, there was some technical difficulties. Let's see whether we can invite him this time. Thank you so much for taking time off to do this. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yes. So, uh, YB, we, no there are two things we have in common. I'm not a YB. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm projecting for the future. Yeah. So, so Mr. Sharil, there are two things we have in common. Sure, One is you. we were both yeah. born in the, in the same year, same month. The other is we are both Jordis. Uh-huh. Uh, so, this will be, this will be a Very good nice. uh, conversation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, state elections. I want to pick your brain. What, what can we understand from the state elections? What are the takeaways? TLDR. Uh, that number one, uh, what's happened over the last eight months in the unity government hasn't been enough to uh, swing opinion, especially among the Malay electorate, uh, to support the unity coalition. So that's one uh, key takeaway. Uh, the second key takeaway for me, which is related to the first, uh, my read is that uh, people want um, government to uh, govern and less and behave less like an opposition. And similarly, uh, I hope they also want an opposition that behaves like an opposition and not one that tries to uh, get into power by some back door. So those are my two, you know, straightaway takeaways. Right. So uh, you would say that the Pakatan Harapan BN government is still behaving like an opposition and Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim especially? Um, so I think there have been moments. Uh, there have been moments where uh, the... Uh, people in government, including the Prime Minister, perhaps could have focused more on uh, the economic narrative of this country and less uh, on more personal-based attacks, which I think uh, coloured a lot of the campaign and even before the state elections happened. So I think it's more of, uh, let's get back to governing, and uh, I think that's what people want to judge him on. Yeah, why, why, why is that the case? I, I share your sentiments. Why do you think he's doing that when it's clearly a losing strategy, right? Why, why is he not focusing on the economic issues? Yeah. So to be fair to him, um, and I'm about to write an op-ed uh, and a commentary on, on the same topic. To be fair, uh, it wasn't actually clear that it was a losing strategy. Um, hmm. I think to, to give him his due. Uh, there might have been a thinking, uh, not entirely unfounded, that the uh, uh, current government led by him needed to land some punches on the opponent that tried to position itself as a clean alternative to AMNO and to Barisan National, with which he is in bed now. And perhaps he needed to ensure that the public had a more, in his mind, fuller view of what the opposition was. Uh, and also, uh, similarly, perhaps there was a thinking that uh, he needed to challenge the perhaps taken for a granted assumption that the Prikata National Opposition spoke for, you know, Malay causes or Bumiputra interests, and he did it to dent that assumption. So perhaps that's, that was the thinking. But, um, you know, one should always be guided by results and by outcomes. Uh, and the state elections indicate that that approach hasn't yielded the positive outcomes for him politically that perhaps he had hoped for. Okay. Thank you so much. So the state elections means that he probably survives, right? Oh yeah. So I, I think uh, all of these things that we have touched and are about to touch uh, are completely separate issues that does not that do not uh, indicate uh, any question of stability or security in government. For me, as you have as you might have heard a few minutes ago, I was keen to stress that the opposition too needs to behave like one. Um, and be right. a credible opposition and not try to, you know, do a Sheraton 2.0 or anything of that sort. Right. Which probably they are plotting, right? 
at this point in time. Uh, they might they might try to plot, but uh, I hope they don't. And even if they do, I think uh, the analysis is it, a lot of things need to happen uh, for for that outcome to uh, come by. We have the anti hopping law, which really disincentivizes uh, MPs to do anything uh, funky. Uh, there's also the uh, the fact that uh, even if a handful of MPs were to take that risk and force a by-election and even win those by-elections, probably still not enough uh, numbers to topple a government. So right. all of those reasons uh, suggest to me that there's no need to be alarmist about the stability or the security of the prime ministership and of the current coalition government. Right. There will be you know, uh, heightened politics maybe for the foreseeable future, but that's very different from saying that the government will not last. I think it will. Right. So, and, and would your analysis have been different if Selangor had fallen to Perikatan? Uh, it would have been, yeah, it would have been maybe different because then I think uh, all the things that needed to occur for uh, a fallen government to happen may have been less unlikely, is how I would word it. Right. But, you know, uh, it's 3-3 now, even though it was more of a Perikatan national friendly 3-3, it is still 3-3. So, uh, there's enough to go with and there's enough to tell everyone, look, um, it's not entirely status quo. There is a shift uh, of the Malay vote towards the opposition, but not in anywhere near the scale uh, to cause any short-term panic in terms of, again, the security and stability of the federal government. Right. And so you, I've, I've listened to your podcast, so I sort of know the answer. Uh, you do not believe in the green wave analysis that has dominated much of popular media. Do you or? Uh, I think yeah. my 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 podcast co-host is a bit more um, a bit more, uh, you know, uh, emphatic. Uh, emphatic <laughs> about <laughs> not using green wave. I I hear where he comes from, and I think it's less about whether there is a wave or not. That's to me, there's clearly a wave. You know, it may not be a massive wave, but there is a wave. Uh, it's the characterization of it being green that is perhaps problematic. Because one, there's a certain um, latent potential dog whistling element in, yes, in the, the word green wave. So that's that. But indeed. for political analysts, perhaps it's, it's, it's more important to say it's more complicated than mm. to suggest it's simply about uh, a reversion to some sort of, um, some sort of religious sanctuary um, when actually some of the factors driving this are... Mm you know, for the lack of a better term, secular. Uh, it could be about frustration with the economy. It could be about um, frustration about the way the unity government has um, painted uh, some of their opponents. Maybe it's about uh, how some people might feel uh, you know, misrepresented or might feel like you know, what they voted for in G15 didn't transpire. Uh, might feel at a certain hypocrisies in government right. doing things that they said they wouldn't do when they were in opposition. It's all of those things right. uh, which to me does not paint a picture of some, some religious awakening in a simplistic sense. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharil, because that's absolutely right. Especially, you know, in academia, there tends to be a more liberal and, you know, anti-pass uh, kind of sentiment. And I, I find yeah. that a lot of the analysis have have almost forgotten to mention that Zaid is the deputy prime minister. Like that seems to be something that concerns a lot of voters. Like exactly what you say, like the hypocrisy, and that's just one of it. There were other things. I mean, sure. surely that matters as well. Do you think that's Anwar's biggest Achilles heel? It is one of his Achilles heels. Um, uh, how he handles and justifies the the situation with the broader public, um, and in my mind the way he gets out of it or the way he responds, given what we've seen in the state elections, should be to focus on the economy and should be to showcase his strengths in articulating an economic vision and a future for the country. I think rather than go after opponents or rather than try and uh, justify things that are difficult to justify, um, perhaps go back to his strengths and go back to his coalition strengths. Uh, nobody would doubt that there are good people inside government and inside cabinet able to talk about the economy and able to appear superior than their opponents when it comes to economic policy making. Uh, 
maybe play on that more uh, versus what they've been doing uh, in the last few months. Does he need to drop Zaid then, you think? Um, I think he will have to weigh the risks of doing and not doing it. Uh, it is clear to me that uh, they uh, they are on very friendly terms, so in terms of their history, uh, extremely friendly. So it's not going to be easy for him to do that, and uh, that's not a small matter of that being the being the army president. Mm. Um, this could have been a different conversation in November 2022 right. before the cabinet was formed. But now that he is in position as deputy prime minister, dropping him is very different from not appointing him in the first place. Yeah, why? Why, so why was uh, that decision made to begin with? Like it seems like Anwar had more cards to play at that point in time. Why? Why put yeah. yourself in this predicament? I guess the hope was that uh, people would move on, and he would be able to convince people that it's not a, it's a price worth paying. Um, evidently, he hasn't been able to, uh, and now he's in a, as you say, predicament or in a position where it's a bit more difficult to drop compared to not a point, right? So, uh, I don't think I I would be surprised uh, if he does drop. Uh, so I don't expect to. He'll just have to find another way to deal with this. Right. Okay. So I mean, moving on to your party, I think that's a good segue, right? Uh, it's still your party, right? Because you're only uh, on suspension. So, uh, what 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 does the future hold for your party? Um, so to be clear, I'm suspended, but I consider myself a free agent because I'm not going to be. I'm not going to let people. Uh, decide for me what I am or I'm not going to do. Uh, so yeah, it's a suspension in name for six years and that's, uh, that's a long time. And I'm not about to just hang around and wait. So I will make decisions based on what I think is best. If, if it is still Amno oh. in the future, then it will have to be, you know, it will have to be justified to me on my own terms. So I have to convince myself uh, rather than it being an automatic default choice. Um, but to your, to your more you know, pertinent question, uh, about what happens here from here on out. I think uh, a lot of things need to happen, but it begins with the uh, recognition that the leadership uh, does not work. Right. right. Beginning from the very top uh, uh, yeah. has become a liability to the party. Um, so that's, I think, step number one, right. which they will have to accept. Um, but that alone is not, a, not, not enough. It begins with that. Uh, but then after that, it would have to require, it would require uh, a clear, um, clear thinking and clear answer about to the question of what does Amno stand for now that they are in government with uh, Pakatan Harapan. They can no longer be the right wing champion for Malays uh, by definition, almost. Mm. Um, mm. And I think that's a good thing, by the way, because I've always been to the left of the party. Uh, but mm. they will now have to articulate what the alternative vision is for for them as a Malay party, and they will have to do that without the help of personnel, perhaps best suited to do that. Uh, because your Kairis are out, the Hishams are out to a lesser extent. Someone like me, Sharil, also out. Uh, so, you know, you will have to deal with people like Zahid and others who are not known to be, you know, moderate leaders uh, to speak that moderate language. So that's another challenge that they'll have to figure out. Say even if Zahid leaves the stage, you've got Muhammad Hassan, you've got Ashraf Wajidi, you've got people who are, uh, you know, really uh, right-wingers in their, in their outlook and in their history. Uh, so I'm not sure how they go from What about Ismail Sabri? Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't think he is at the moment, uh, you know, being considered as anything other than a, uh, other than a prime minister who's, who has served this time. Um, of course, he's still a very respected, respected uh, senior member of the party. And by definition, he, because of him not belonging to the current faction, There'll always be some intrigue around him, uh, but I don't think um, I don't think, in terms of the question I mentioned uh, or the the solution I mentioned to try and bring Amnu to the center and a moderate voice within Pakatan Harapan, uh, he will be part of the equation. Uh, of course, there is another more dramatic uh, path that the party can take in the absence of a Zahid uh, leadership, which is to pull Amnu out of the coalition altogether. I am not for that personally, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, if that were to occur, then yeah, it's another set of leaders who maybe can uh, can carry that kind of message through. Why are you 
not for that for i'm no leaving the college so i'm not for i'm not for i'm no leaving the coalition because i think um, you've we've already or i'm no has already made up its decision or made up its mind to be with the coalition government uh what has transpired since um is that people have rejected the party i think it would be a shortcut to or a misreading of the situation to say that uh, all we have to do or all amno has to do is to di- cut ties with dap or with pakatan and everything will be fine uh, it was different again different in november 2022 when there was a decision to be made then maybe at that time uh, for me i was in favor of staying in opposition and not supporting either side maybe just give confidence and supply to uh, anwar as prime minister but not be part of government but now that you are in government and you have gone around the country uh, talking up this union saying that you know pakatan so much better than prikata <laughs> you know uh, this this union has always been on the cards so <laughs> this is the new future for amnu and for malaysia to suddenly do an about turn just because of a bad elections i think is um, would not would not yield the, the results that they had hoped what is required is uh, something else more profound which is uh, the bravery and the courage to change leadership and courage to rearticulate what its position and its uh, places in this new politics that it itself has create, created would it be fair for me to say that 2018 2022 and the recent state elections are all uh, a reflection of the rejection of amno currently but not amno ideologies and what amno stands for because the alternative is still perikatan national which is essentially some version of amno maybe a more right wing version of amno but is it fair uh, for me to say that and the implication being if amno reforms people are willing to accept it so it's not a rejection of amno ideologies per se i think it's not a rejection of ideology that speaks about malay politics and uh, puts the malay uh, agenda front and center Uh, so if that's what you yeah. mean then absolutely there's no argument mm. against that mm. because that was what prekata national campaigned mm. on uh, and they got anything between 65 to 70% of the malay vote uh, mm. in in the elections just just last week uh, so by definition that is true now does that mean that if amno reforms and returns to that then it can win back support yes but now they have a competitor now they have right. uh, they have uh, someone else who has taken that home and they themselves allowed um, that somebody else to take that home right uh, so it will be it'll be a bit more complicated than maybe before um, but yes to to answer your question is the ideology still alive that ideology is still alive it just seems to be alive in somebody else's body now right okay so there is no way to reclaim that body basically even by kicking out zahid or <laughs> that I mean, you never say never with these things right uh, but once you have lost that ground to regain that ground it's not going to be straightforward unless there's some sort of union which i don't see happening um you know they tried that in 2018 to 2020 clearly didn't go well um also uh, like i said there's the more uh, i hope progressive alternative which is that okay now that they've stumbled uh, through whatever reason and whatever motivations that caused them to be with Pakatan Harapan now that they're with PH um find a way to make that work right and uh find a place to be the centrist Malay party which for a while in the I, I, in my mind 80s and 90s and early 2000s they yeah. were yeah absolutely yeah uh, so i think a lot of people forget that people think amno has always been this or oh, has no. always been yeah exactly i mean they were not right they were more center more moderate in many ways so just right. now uh, mr sharil you mentioned your own future you are a free agent what are the options you are one of the hottest free agents in malaysia what are the options no, realistic <laughs> realistic options for you dap once you i'm sure perikatan uh, has made uh, an approach so what's stopping you from being the tonali of malaysian politics oh nice nice <laughs> reference i don't think i don't know if everybody would have gotten that reference, but, uh, but uh, well option number one is to do what i'm doing now which is to stay out of frontline politics and uh, do other things uh, as you know as you well know i'm uh, finishing up my fellowship with rsis at ntu 
uh, that's been a privilege and something that I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I'm now found, I founded an advisory firm to work on you know, corporate advisory and also an advisory around politics and uh, kind of giving investors, outside investors, a view of Malaysia and uh, helping with their risk assessments of this country and particular investment opportunities that we have. I do capital raising and fundraising for uh, private funds from Europe and US who need money and capital from Southeast Asia. These are all very exciting things that uh, kind of build off my previous life uh, in, um, in corporate uh, Malaysia before. Um, so I'm quite happy doing that for the moment. Uh, so that's option one, to not rush into anything, and that's the option I'm taking at the moment. Uh, later on down the line, uh, if I get that itch again, and if I feel feel that uh, being in politics is still uh, something that I think is worthwhile doing, then I'll, I'll survey the options at that point if I'm still uh, a wanted entity. It's quite possible that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not discounting the possibility that after a while, you know, I'm no longer... Uh, hot property or anything like that. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, so it's one of those things where I'm not absolutely desperate to go back in. Uh, and it has to be right uh, for me, right for my family, um, and has to be on the terms that I think are good. Is there any party where you say, no, I will not join this party at this point in time? Uh, <laughs> I think... Um, no, I don't want to say that on record because number one, you never know what's going to happen in the future. And then, you know, suddenly in five years, I joined that particular party I said <laughs> no to. What I will say, how I would respond to your question is I want a party that is closer to my to my worldview than maybe uh, before. So when I joined UMNO, it was a different type of UMNO as you probably would have you know, glean from some of my answers. Yeah. Yeah. It was an Amno that was more progressive, more reformist, that was talking about abolishing ISA and eventually did. Uh, it was an Amno that was open to, um, you know, kind of re-articulating what multiracial Malaysia was um, and starting to, although respectfully, some of the uh, sacred cows that uh, define a lot of Malaysia's uh, race-based policies and starting to think, you know, maybe we need to innovate, maybe we need to do things that are more up-to-date, uh, still defending the spirit of the constitution, still not compromising on a special position of Malays, but uh, articulating that and translating that into more up-to-date policies, meaning, you know, they were, we were really starting to think of, do we need to, you know, uh, have smaller quotas instead of the same thing? Do we need to think about opening up university places? These were things that were in conversation in the early, mid 2000s, late 2000s when I joined the party. And not coincidentally, um, it was a time when Abdullah Ahmad Badawi Patla was the president of UMNO, not Mahadeh. So it was a different time. Mm. Uh, I think that progressive type of UMNO uh, became smaller and smaller uh, after the 13th general election, after 2013. Right. After Amno did not win the kind of support under Najib then uh, for lost the, the non or the yeah, yeah lost the uh, lost the tutors in two thousand eight, but 2000, then in 2013, yeah. 2013 lost yeah. the popular vote. Twenty thirteen yeah. lost, lost the popular, popular vote, vote. Yeah. Uh, and there was a frustration I think within the Amno leadership that after all all the quote unquote liberal and progressive policies that had done, um, it was still the conservative base that voted yeah. for them and not the not the you know liberal non Malay urban. Uh, crowd, which still went to Pakatan. Uh, so from then onwards, I think for the last 10 years, uh, Amnu has been sliding to the right, more to the right, more to the right. And um, obviously, I uh, it coincided with my, uh, you know, career advancement in the party, but it was not always the most comfortable place for me uh, because of the, you know, the, the ideology that didn't sit well with me at all times. Not, you know, not, not, 100% of the time there were times that you know I didn't feel um, I didn't feel super comfortable mm. so I give you an example while it, when uh, yeah. a lot of people in the party were saying um, very nice things about um, that Indian um, former Indian national um, preacher um, his name escapes me now for whatever reason Zakir Naik uh, yeah. correct Zakir Naik okay. yeah. uh, Zakir Naik was uh, you know he said some nasty things about mm. um, non Malays in Malaysia um, who um, who he said you know should should leave the country, uh, and I spoke out against that, right. and I got censured by some people inside the party, 
right. because that was seen to be going against the the spirit of you know conservative right wing Malay Muslim politics at that time and even today I mm. guess who would see Zakir Naik as if not a hero but somebody somebody on their side right. whereas to my mind no the moment he said that you know Malay Chinese and Indian shouldn't be in this country I think he crossed the line mm. uh, so that's an example right, where right. I wasn't you know uh, comfortable mm. um so yeah i guess that's a long-winded way of saying that if i do go back into politics and if i do um if i do choose a party um it would have to at least uh be closer to my 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 belief system or my worldview because when you're younger i guess you are more wide-eyed and more you know happy to go with things uh i as you get older uh and in my case more a bit more experience in politics Maybe I have less patience uh, for <laughs> BS and for nonsense. So I want to be harder on myself. I want to be harder on myself. And I, I know being in politics means there's compromises that will have to yeah. happen. But maybe those compromises shouldn't be as um, troubling as they were for yeah. me at times. Right. So interesting that you said that because I actually wanted to ask earlier also, uh, does the experience of Muda and Said Sadiq serve as a cautionary tale for you in first pass the post systems you still need to be part of the big parties can go on your own and and understand that uh, you want to be harder on yourself but there still needs to be far more compromised than uh, yeah. than someone would ideally like yeah um that's why option one is very nice which is that i don't have to have this headache right? <laughs> but that's not you right you you want to be part of it. it depends uh there's a part of me by the way that starts thinking is there a different way to make impact without entering malaysian politics right and that's a honest conversation i have to have for myself mm. there's an assumption that everybody has to be in politics or politics is the best way to do this that's yeah that's true for some um but it's also an arena where as you well said and as i've said compromises have to be made and compromises have to make, be made to achieve you know to make one uh, small step forward uh, when when your hope was to make 10 right uh, and that can be extremely frustrating and that can be extremely hard on someone who anyone who who has a belief system uh, who isn't just a career driven politician uh, which i'm not for some people and this is really not a moral judgment because these people really do well at things and maybe achieve more um for them it's about getting power first and no matter what just get power and then do what you can right. and they don't lose so much sleep about <laughs> um you know saying things they don't fully believe in or compromising whereas maybe characters like me i i do lose sleep over it and that i can share with you not them out i can be be more honest you know there have been many nights that i've lost sleep about it and mm. i just didn't it didn't sit right with me i was forced to say things that i didn't fully believe in i was forced to say quiet more, more often it was the latter i was forced to stay silent on things that i didn't believe in just because i had to be a team player and just because i had to be which i understand that is the name of the game and that's going to be true in corporate life too right. uh, or in any international ngo or organization that you join so i i'm not i'm not naive about that uh, but uh, but yeah uh, that's why you know i i'm seriously not seriously considering but i'm not discounting the possibility that i never go back and I, i i do impact in some other way but if i do go back um you are right i have to weigh the option of trying to be pure or you know fully idealistic with the realities of of first past the post politics which is that you probably need to be in a bigger party and a big coalition or uh, one of the two right um and it's never going to be 100% in line with your thinking even if you were the head of that party one day it's still not going to be 100% aligned to your thinking um so for me um if i were to go back probably have to accept that uh that scenario but maybe make a choice that is closer to my belief so that 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 uh, compromise quotient is is smaller right okay thank you final substantive question before we end on a more like hearted note so what's your vision your realistic vision for race politics in malaysia in the near future like it must be a realistic one that we can achieve uh so could you repeat the question so what's my what, vision what's for... your vision for race politics in malaysia oh a realistic one yeah a realistic one <laughs> is uh one that is able to um you know is able to celebrate differences as an asset i know this sounds cliche 
But I think sometimes going back to that basics and that, that was stuff we used to say in school. Mm. I just don't know if we're doing that enough anymore. Um, and now difference is seen as something that is hierarchical. It's purely seen as something to be managed. It's not seen to be as something to be celebrated. Mm. Mm. I think uh, Malaysia's economic future relies in part in celebrating those differences because one of our selling point is that multicultural and multilingual uh, character of this country. Because other countries can say they are multicultural, other countries can say they are multiracial too, but not many can say multilingual the way Malaysia and perhaps Singapore can, right? Uh, mm. But Malaysia is bigger right. um, and and has you know more diversity in terms of its uh, in terms of its um, geographical area as well. Yeah. Right? Um, so for that reason too, um, economic reason too, I think multiculturalism is a is a point to celebrate. And I think the future of this country in terms of political stability, in terms of um, you know, people getting along has got to do again with that basic point of celebrating differences. So in a realistic time horizon of say 10 years, I would like us to go back to that. So um, I think we've regressed. I think it's become more polarized. I think it's become more pointed and those polarization and pointedness have an, have an ethnic, um, ethnic flavor to it. Um, and it's definitely the most polarized I feel uh, mm. in my adult lifetime. So I don't want to dream of something so big. I just want to go back to where things were when maybe I was a younger person. Right. And I think your podcast uh, does that really well. Uh, you really have diverse guests. You call everybody on. And it's not just racial diversity, but especially ideological party diversity. And I really commend you for that. I think that's one of the ways if you can show that different people can come together and discuss, you know, in a civil, humorous way, I think it sets the tone for... For politics, although I would say in Malaysia, even though the politicians fight in public, a lot of times be after that, uh, behind the cameras they are all friends, right? But the <laughs> the animosity translates to the masses who do not see that side of. Uh, would, would you agree with that? I would half agree. <laughs> uh, I think yes, there is. There are many instances where they are actually friendly behind the scenes. But uh, there are also many instances where the animosity is real and deep. <laughs> um, and one of the things I've always said is, you know, um, there's something about this generation of politicians that are maybe one or two generations ahead mm. of me uh, who have done so much to each other yeah. Um, yeah. or are perceived to have done so much to each right. other. Right. And these are things that, you know, uh, are not normal in terms of uh, healthy competition. These are things, when I say not normal, these are things about liberty. These are things about people being in jail. These are things about people's um, livelihoods being you know, affected. It's very hard to bridge that kind of history um, and animosity versus perhaps my generation of politicians. Yeah, we have our brickbats and we have our uh, you know, arguments, quarrels, but you know, we've never actually hurt each other in the same right. way. Right, right, uh, so right. I think, um, so I half agree with you. I think the younger generation especially can get along quite easily. Right. The older ones, I think there's some real legacy issues that perhaps will never be, right. some wounds that will never be healed. Right. Thank you so much. And you so can see that now, right? You yeah, can, yeah, can definitely. <laughs> like, definitely, yeah. I think Mahade, the Mahade Anwar conflict, uh, for instance, has defined much of Malaysian politics, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. So let's end with a rapid fire. So I'll just say something. You quickly give me like very quick thoughts on, on it. Sure. So favorite politician? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Obama. Okay. Okay. Favorite Malaysian politician? Uh, if I don't say myself, <laughs> then I say my co-host. Like. <laughs> okay. Mahadeh Muhammad. What am I supposed to say? What? I need Thing you want. <laughs> oh. Uh. Hmm. Tragic end. <laughs> oh, okay. Not, not, not in the literal sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we don't know how, how when, when that will happen. He seems very healthy. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim? I hope you're not going to say tragic end also. No. <laughs> Um, yet to fulfill the promise. Okay. Kairi Jamaluddin? Yet to fulfill the promise. <laughs>
Okay. In a different way. Said Sadiq. Yeah. Going through a tough time? Ideal Prime Minister for you. Like, just like character traits? Person. Oh, person. Uh, Can be yourself as well. Oh. Well, I shouldn't say myself. <laughs> uh, a, a, a mix of somebody as mercurial as Kyrie and someone as um, level headed and you know more zen as um, as Najib was in his first term. Oh, interesting. Okay, final one, Singapore. Mm, has been kind to me. Ah, that, that's that's a very nice way to end. You know, so one of the legacy issues with older polit Malaysian politicians is also animosity with Singapore, which I do not find in younger politicians. So hopefully, when your generation fully takes over, the relationship between the two countries will be much better as well. Uh, sure. Ch Ch Sharil, YB Sharil. Thank you so much. And I know you are extremely busy. You are doing this podcast on the go, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All the best for Thanks, your man. for your uh, the remaining uh, days in Singapore, but also for your future. I'm sure you will play a huge part in Malaysia's future. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Good night. Bye-bye.